if I were to tell you that I am the most delightful person in the world, my feeling is aglow, I'm lighting up like a light bulb. If I could be emulated, the energy situation would be cured immediately. <laughs> Michael Dukakis is a native son of Massachusetts. And I got to thinking the other night when I was watching Yankee Doodle Dandy. <laughs> the James Cagney and Michael Dukakis are about the same size. <laughs> and one is just about the same as the other when it comes to their Americanism. Most of you are not as old as I am. But how I remember that battle in 1988. When the devils came up from hell and attacked one of the most congenial born to lead men that we have ever put up for president of the United States. It's not because I'm from Boston. That has nothing to do with it. What it has to do with is common decency. Think for a minute what the world would be like had the election been different. Would we be attacking people with no provocation? Would we be bombing on a weekly day basis just to keep them in line no. and then choose to attack anyway? I don't think so. Because we let bulliness, money, decide who was going to be our president in 1988. And the world has not been the same since. I don't mean to moan and be grown things. Others can do that. I voted the way I ought to have voted. But I want to say one thing that Michael Dukakis said, and it's a direct quote. A kid of immigrants became a governor three times, ran for president, a true, a true American story. I am so in love with this country. It was fortunate to be involved for 30 years in public life. Lots of us have a dream. Most of us have a dream. I lived my dream. May I present to you the governor, former governor of, of Massachusetts, and a wonderful presidential candidate who should have won in 1988, <laughs> Governor Bruckner. The next time I run for the presidency, <laughs> Al O'Brien is going to be my campaign manager. Al, thank you so much. Let me begin with an obvious disclaimer, folks. If I knew anything about presidential politics, I'd be here in another capacity. <laughs> so don't assume that I know any more than you do, and I mean that. And all of you know a lot more than these so-called experts that are talking on television night after night after night. <laughs> Don't let anybody tell you that uh, a person of reasonable intelligence who tries to stay reasonably well-informed can't make the same, if not better, judgments than some of these folks that are getting paid to talk to us night after night after night. Because if they knew anything, they wouldn't have been telling us last year that the two clear front runners were Hillary Clinton and Rudy Giuliani, right? <laughs> now, how did they know that? Well, that's what the polls said. Except these polls that are taken in the year before the election year are utterly worthless. Now, you can do some polling that's helpful. What's bothering people? What are they concerned about? What are the things they're looking for in a candidate? That kind of stuff. That may be helpful. But these horse race polls, as we call them, that for some reason the national media insists on doing and paying for in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, beginning in January, February, March, April, and May of the year before the year, are utterly worthless, and yet we spend all kinds of time listening to them and listening to these so-called experts telling us what they mean. I don't know what it is with the national media in this country. They're obsessed with trying to figure out who the frontrunner is. Have you noticed? Pity the poor frontrunner. Obama had better look out. Because if the perception develops that he's the front runner, you never know what's going to happen. 
I'm serious. When I started in 1987, the spring of 87, I was at zero in the national polls. I mean zero. The front runner, well, who was the front runner, front runner in the 19, in 1987 in my race? Any of you remember the Democratic side? This fellow named Gary Hart, remember him? <laughs> then we had that monkey business thing, remember? <laughs> and by the way, I don't want to be critical of Hart, I mean, it wasn't his fault. He got out, came back in in November, they went out and took another poll, he was the front runner again. And yet those of us who had been campaigning for months knew that for a variety of reasons, he didn't have a prior. He got 2% of the vote in Iowa and dropped out the next day. And yet he was the front runner. So don't assume that these folks know more than you do, folks, or that they know more than the American people. And by the way, even though, as I will explain in a minute, we've got to do something about this nominating process, because it really is kind of nutty. In an interesting kind of way, it has worked its will. And whatever you think of John McCain or Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, we've got three pretty formidable candidates still standing. And one of them is going to be the next president of the United States. There's something about the process, even though it has to be changed, and I'll try to suggest a few ways that maybe we can at least think about changing it, that does weed out the fakers. Now, I don't know whether I was asked about the former governor of Massachusetts the last time we were here, the fellow that just endorsed McCain. But had I been as subtly as I could, Al, I would have tried to explain to people, and I want to put this gently, that Mitt Romney's a fraud. <laughs> and he was a lousy governor, a lousy governor. And I kind of, I know, well, maybe we disagree, but I kind of liked his dad. As a matter of fact, the truth be known, I courted my beautiful wife in a little yellow Rambler convertible because George Romney was the only guy in Detroit at the time who was building a small fuel-efficient car in the 1950s. Remember the Rambler? Yes. I talk to my students these days about the Studebaker, the Hudson, and the Rambler. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, he was... A darn good governor. He was a Secretary of Housing and Urban Development who, believe it or not, believed in affordable housing and provided very significant leadership to those of us at the state level who were trying to do something about housing back when the public housing projects weren't working and we were experimenting with mixed income housing and Section 8 and a variety of things. He was terrific. And I thought we were getting a junior version of him in his son. And unfortunately, we didn't. Smart, slick, and a faker. And, uh, in a very interesting way, I thought, feel free to disagree, and we're going to open this up for lots of questions. I thought the process kind of smoked him out on this. Uh, you know, every week there was a new Mitt Romney. Somebody said, well, Romney was a turnaround artist. You know, if you're a turnaround artist, you try something. If it doesn't work, you try something else. If it doesn't work, you try something else. I mean, he was doing it every week, right? Um, and, and so uh, Fred Thompson, remember? Thompson was going to sweep the field. He was very quiet. Did you notice that? You know why Thompson was so quiet? The screenwriters were on strike. The screenwriters were on strike. Yeah. yeah. The screenwriters were on strike, Clancy. Um, so in an interesting way, I think it has narrowed the field quite successfully, if I can use those terms. And uh, I can't tell you today, and I'm not being coy, I can't tell you what's going to happen on the Democratic side. Uh, it's entirely possible that Hillary Clinton will come back with decisive victories in Texas, in Ohio, in Pennsylvania. Uh, if she does, we're going to have a race that's very, very tight. Uh, the superdelegates, whether you like it or not, are all elected. I listened to Anderson Cooper. Somebody said, nobody elected them. No, they're all elected. But for better or for worse, they were an effort to kind of blend some seasoned veteran elected officials into the mix of popularly elected delegates. Um, and I'm not a super delegate, but if I were, I suppose I'd be looking at these two folks and saying to myself, okay, um, which one of them can be the better president? Um, who has run the better campaign and who is likely 
to win the presidency. And frankly, I'm not sure I can tell you that, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit um, when we get into when we get into our, our Q and A. Uh, now, just a few reflections on the process, and then maybe a focus on one particular aspect of it, which happens to be an obsession of mine. And then I hope we can have a good, lively discussion. First, it seems to me it's high time, long past, when we get rid of the, ele the Electoral College. I mean, uh, those of you who know anything about the history of Electoral College know that it, you know, it's a profoundly anti-democratic institution. Uh, um, the framers of the Constitution were extraordinary people. But let's face it, they were 55 white guys who met in secret in Philadelphia. They were, by and large, quite affluent. Uh, and even with a very limited electorate, folks, because at that time, ladies, you couldn't vote. People of color effectively couldn't vote. And white guys who didn't have any property couldn't vote. You had an electorate which only represented 10 to 15 percent of the population. And even then, the framers didn't, choose, didn't trust these people in a direct election of the president. They wanted them to vote for guys like them who would then make the decision. Now, subsequently, that changed with Jacksonian democracy and a variety of other things. And, and people began demanding at least that the electors tell them who they were going to vote for. But um, what happened in 2000, in my opinion, was unacceptable. And frankly, had John Kerry won Ohio, he would have been president because he had won the Electoral College. But I'll bet he would not have had a majority or plurality of the votes. And that would have been just as unacceptable. I mean that. I mean that. Now. There is a relatively, I don't want to call it easy, but an easier way to get rid of the Electoral College than having to go through the elaborate process of amending the Constitution. If a sufficient number of states representing at least 270 electoral votes vote to join an interstate compact which commits them to voting their electors for the candidate that wins a majority or a plurality of the popular vote, that's the end of the Electoral College. Two states have already acted to do so. Maryland, New Jersey just did it. California legislature passed the bill. Schwarzenegger, for reasons I don't understand, vetoed it. I would hope he would rethink that. But it seems to me it's high time that we join the rest of the human race and count the votes. This is one country, after all, these days. And I don't know of anyone who thinks that this thing makes sense, except maybe some of the smaller states, for reasons which, for the most part, are misguided, think they're benefiting from that. Now, people say to me, well, if you do that, Dukakis, then all the candidates will do this campaign in New York City and Chicago and Los Angeles, maybe San Diego, and so on and so forth. Well, these days, in case you've missed it, in the last month of the campaign, what do the candidates do? They go from Michigan to Ohio to Florida to Missouri, to Michigan to Ohio to Florida to Missouri. I mean, that's what they do for the last month of the campaign, which doesn't seem to me to be a significant improvement over the other thing. Not only that, but as I will try to explain in a minute, if the parties, and especially my party, would finally start getting serious about precinct-based grassroots organization, every single one of those votes would count, no matter where they were cast. And I think that would be a good thing. So I think we've got to reform this Electoral College thing, and that interstate compact is one way to do it. Secondly, we've got to do something to improve the nominating process, even though in a curious kind of way it's kind of worked its will fairly well this time around. Now, there are lots of suggestions for doing so. The National Association of Secretaries of State just reissued their plan recommending a series of four regional primaries. I kind of like six, two in February, two in March, two in April, either rotated one after the other, so you don't start with the same people over and over again. If for historic and other reasons uh, folks want to start with Iowa and New Hampshire, that's okay with me. Um, I have to tell you that campaigning in Iowa was a very important experience for me. I was this guy from New England, didn't know a hell of a lot about corn, hogs, or any of that kind of stuff, and I'm not, I'm being serious. Um, I spent 85 campaign days in the state of Iowa. I was in every one of the 99 counties. Kitty was in 75 of them. But let me tell you, we learned a lot from those folks. They're good people. And they spend a lot of time listening to you before they make up their minds. And I was fortunate enough. I didn't win, but I was fortunate enough to do very well in the caucuses. And I, I carried the state by, I don't know what it was, 9, 10, 11 points against George Bush I in the final. 
and it was a great experience. Now, New Hampshire for me was kind of easy. You know, if you're from Massachusetts, it's like going to Worcester, for those of you who, you know, I mean, going to Nashville and Manchester and Concord isn't that difficult. And in any event, they talk like us, Al, right, up there. So it kind of felt as if I was home. Um, and they were very good to me. Uh, and if the Massachusetts guy doesn't win New Hampshire, I mean, uh, you know, it doesn't look so good. Um, but um, so there, there are something to be said for requiring the candidates to do some retail campaigning, as we say, in those two states. But, but I think uh, a half a dozen regional primaries spread out over a period of time does make sense. And at least the candidates can campaign in the same time zone for a couple of weeks. I mean, think about it, folks. New Jersey, California, New Jersey, California, New Jersey, California. Try that a few times. Let's see what time of the night you're waking up. Um, now, it's not perfect. There may be other ways to do it. I have a colleague in the political science department in the Northeast, a guy named Bill Mayer, who doesn't exactly agree with me in the regional primaries, but thinks there has to be uh, some greater order in uh, all of this. And he may be right. Um, on the other hand, if you're going to have rules, the states have to abide by them. And uh, what Michigan and Florida did, in my opinion, was unacceptable. Uh, pity the poor candidates with states trying to jump the queue. And there were rules. Now, the Republicans decided to sanction them by cutting the delegates in half. The Democrats said no representation under any circumstances. Uh, I can't tell you what's going to happen in the Democratic Congresses, uh, in the Democratic contest as we, we proceed now over the course of the next several weeks, but I know one thing. If uh, anybody tries to count those delegates based on the vote such as it was, um, uh, the folks on the Obama side are going to be very, very angry. I mean, it's not going to happen. You know, do you then authorize caucuses at the 11th hour? I kind of doubt it. But uh, I would be astonished, and I may be wrong, but I would be astonished if, um, on the Democratic side at least, Michigan and Florida play any role in the convention. I mean, they broke the rules. And that's the way the cookie crumbles. Now, what about the final contest itself? And here I'm, I'm going to put on my Democratic hat, not in a partisan sense, but only because I think my party needs to do a lot of work which we have not been doing and which I did not do effectively back in 1988. Now, I lost for a lot of reasons in 1988, folks. Probably the most important in some ways was the fact that I made a deliberate decision, it was my decision, nobody else's, that I was not going to respond to the Bush attack campaign. That was a huge mistake. Now, how you deal with an attack campaign is not easy. Because I wasn't, maybe I was the first for a while to be subjected to that, but by no means the last. Bill Clinton learned from me. And in 1992, he had a unit in his campaign of about 10 people, half of whom worked for me in 88. In fact, they called themselves the Defense Department. I'm serious. I'm serious. All they did was deal with the Bush attack campaign, which was just as tough, if not more so, on Clinton than it was on me. But it was less effective because he was ready for it. And the challenge, and this is not easy, is, not, is to come up with a strategy for dealing with the attack campaign that not only blunts the attack, but if possible, turns it into a character issue on the guy who's doing it. I utterly failed to do that in 1988, and unfortunately, my former lieutenant governor and the Democratic nominee in 2004 failed to do it as well. Because just as sure as we're standing or sitting here, it's going to start with a so-called independent committee. And unless you pin responsibility for that so-called independent committee on your opponent, damage is going to be done. That's how the Willie Horton stuff started with me. That's how the Swift Boat start, stuff started with John. Now, I can't tell you what the attack campaign is going to be. Obviously, it depends on whether Hillary or Barack uh, is the nominee. But let me tell you something. It will begin the day after that nomination is clinched. In fact, it will begin in advance depending on what's going on. And um, forewarned is to be forearmed. I mean, this time around, whoever our nominee is going to be ready. And it's going to be vicious. It's going to be vicious. I have no doubt about it. But look, that's the way it is, and, and you've got to be ready for it. I wasn't. It's one of the reasons why I lost. But one of the other reasons I lost was because having run a very good primary campaign, I mean, I came from zero and won. 
And having done so, as I had always done in my victories in Massachusetts, by organizing at the precinct level, we stopped doing the precinct organizing for the final. With one exception, the state of California, where we did about half the precincts. Now, don't ask me why we stopped doing it, but the folks who were supposed to know something about winning presidential campaigns said, well, you don't do that. You know, it's all money and media. I'm here to tell you, it's not all money and media. Because if it were, Hillary Clinton would now have the nomination. How is it that Obama has been winning state after state after state, and especially the caucus states? Which, by the way, just to throw in a little warning, does not automatically translate into victory in the fall. But when it comes to this primary contest, it is quite clear to me, and I assume to you, that with some exceptions, New Hampshire and Nevada being two of them, where for reasons I don't understand, the Obama campaign did not, did not organize at the precinct level. They have had the superior grassroots organization. Still not as good as it ought to be. They didn't do it in California, they lost. They didn't do it in Massachusetts, they lost. They didn't do it in New Jersey, they lost. I don't know why. And they kind of got started on it late. My opinion should have been part and parcel of the Obama campaign from day one. But it clearly has made a difference. Now, whether or not they can create that kind of an organization in a matter of weeks in Texas and Ohio, or for that matter, even Pennsylvania, it's a good question. You don't build a first-class precinct-based organization in a week or two, folks. It takes months. So it won't surprise me if Hillary Clinton wins those states. And if she does, we're going to have ourselves a very interesting challenge as a party. But I will say this to you. Whether our nominee is Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama, if the Democratic Party wants to win this election, and speaking as a Democrat, obviously I can tell you, I think there are huge reasons why we must after the past eight years, seven and a half years. We're gonna to have to organize every single one of the 200,000 precincts in the United States of America. Now, how do you organize a precinct? It's not too complicated, it's not rocket science. You sign up a precinct captain, who then recruits six block or neighborhood captains. The average precincts, about 2,000 voters, 1,000 households. Their job from day one is to make personal contact on an ongoing basis with every single voting household in the precinct. Democrats, independents, and Republicans. And it's not just a one-time thing, and it's not parachuting kids in with two weeks to go. These people have to live in the precinct, look like the precinct, walk like the precinct, and talk like the precinct. If it's a gated community, somebody said, how do you do this in a gated community? Find somebody inside the gated community. Make them a precinct. Make them the precinct captain. This is an ongoing process. It's not just a quick visit. The goal being to make contact with folks, to have conversations with them, to find out what their questions are, to answer those questions. And I want to tell you one quick story, and I don't want to go on at great length about this, which I just heard about the other day. Uh, Obama did not do as well as he should have done in Nevada. One of the reasons for that is that he didn't have a precinct-based organization. And they were sending people in from California. Now, that's better than nothing, but it's, it's not what I'm talking about here. In any event, one of the folks was this very talented young political organizer who now does it for a living, Latino-American, and a very skillful guy, and I happened to have a conversation with him. And they sent him into some place in Nevada, and he was out knocking on doors and knocked up, walked up to some door. There was a guy with a pickup truck in front. He said, call me Jake. And so he started pitching him on Obama. He said, no, nah, I'm, I'm not with your guy. He won't salute the flag. So Marcus said, where'd you get that? He said, I saw it on the internet. <laughs> he said, can I talk to you? Yeah, yeah. He said, this guy leads the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag on the floor of the United States Senate. I mean, where'd you? He spent 40 minutes talking to him. When it was all over, the guy said, I'm with your guy. Now, I would say to you that if this were the final, somebody in the precinct not only should have had the initial conversation, but he should be going back every couple of weeks just to make sure that Jake is still with us. Maybe somebody told him that 
Obama's a Muslim or something. You know, that's been around too. I don't have to tell you. His last name is the same, not that his middle name. Oh, I can't say he went to a madrasa and all that. But, but that's going to that's be part of the dialogue, folks, especially with all this new technology. So you just, it isn't just a one-time thing. What's the goal of all of this? To arrive on Election Day, or at least the week before Election Day, with as many ones and twos as you possibly can. What's a one? They're with you. What's a two? They're leaning in your direction. And then and only then do you get on the phone. No phone banks. Then do you only then do you get on the phone and you call the ones and the twos to make sure they're still with you and they're going to the polls. Now, was this old-fashioned campaigning? Well, in certain parts of the country. Has anybody done it in California with rare exceptions? No. Why don't they? Well, it's a big state. It's a media state. Folks, I don't buy this. I think people in California would be astonished. That a, that a human being would actually actually come to the door, knock on the door, and say, "Hi, I'm here for you know whatever it is, I'd like to talk to you about the election." And don't kid yourself, a good precinct-based organization is worth five to ten percentage points. Easy, easy. And my party simply hasn't been doing it. Now the other side hasn't been doing it either. But what they do is target their base. That is, they look for the folks that are true believers, and they make sure they get out. Now, if one party's doing a 200,000 all-precinct-based campaign and the other side is doing a get-out-your-base campaign, it's the precinct-based campaign that wins. But if the Democrats aren't doing any of this, the Republicans are doing the base stuff, they're going to win. And that's what happened, among other things, in 2004. And one of the things that makes this so important, I think, and potentially so effective, is that unlike in 1988, the internet is an incredible organizing tool, folks. It's, incre it's an incredible fundraising tool, and it's an incredible organizing tool. And one of the things you want to do is make sure that every one of those people that sends you 50 or 100 bucks immediately is enlisted as a precinct captain or a block captain. I mean, Obama's got 700,000 contributors. Kerry had 2 million. The Democratic National Committee has 5 million. Nobody's going to tell me that you can't recruit 200,000 precinct captains from that pool of committed people. Not only that, but as I said a few minutes ago, the Democratic Party has got to stop buying into this red-blue stuff. I was in Kansas in early December. What's the matter with Kansas? Remember the book, What's the Matter with Kansas? Nothing's the matter with Kansas. They have a woman Democratic governor and two out of four Democratic members of Congress. But I listened to one of these so-called experts the other day say Kansas is the reddest of red states. Well, that's interesting. Kathy Sebelius won the governorship with 58% of the vote in Kansas. But the Democrats have kind of written off Kansas. It's a red state. That's dumb, folks. That's dumb. We should be in every one of these states, every single one of them. We may not win them all, but we're going to come a heck of a lot closer. Not only that, but if we're in those states, the Republicans have got to spend time in those states. They can't all go to Ohio and Florida. And we just haven't been doing it. So I hope one of the things that will happen this year at long last, at least on my side of the fence, is that we get serious about this kind of organizing. Not only because it helps you to win elections, but because it engages people, especially young people, in the process in a way that we haven't engaged people for a long time. You know, for most Americans, it's, the whole thing has become a movie, and not a very good one. We sit on our cans and we watch these stupid attack ads, and if we can stand it, maybe half of us go to the polls to vote for the most important political office in the world. And that's not my vision of American democracy. And anybody who's done this will tell you that as you go out and knock on doors, you pick up volunteers every day, who you then try to fully engage, more block captains, potentially more folks running for office and we just aren't doing it. Why? Well, we kind of bought into this notion that it was all money and media and consultants and this kind of stuff. They're not unimportant, don't get me wrong, but they're no substitute for this kind of organizing and this kind of work. And I hope at long last, at least on the Democratic side of the, of the ledger, we're going to see that. I think at this point I've probably said enough. Um, I cannot, for the life of me, predict what's going to happen on the Democratic side, and I certainly can't predict What's going to happen in the final? I think John McCain is going to be a very formidable candidate. He's a guy with some very strong qualities. Now, I think he's off the wall on the war. 
And since I was on the Amtrak board when he was the chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee, uh, you know, he doesn't really think the government has any role to play in building a first-class national rail passenger system, or for that matter, a first-class high-speed rail system for California is something you desperately need. I mean, he's a profoundly conservative guy in ways that trouble me. But, um, but I think he's going to be a formidable candidate. I think he's eminently beatable. But we're not going to beat him on television, folks. We're going to beat him in the street, in the precincts, in the neighborhoods of every single state in the country. That's my view. Anyway, let me stop at this point. I'm sure you've got questions, thoughts, reactions, and uh, happy to. Uh, Governor, I'm not going to ask you who you specifically are supporting between the two running leading candidates, but could you give us a, a kind of a rundown of the talents and pluses that you've observed in each of the candidates, uh, Barack Obama and uh, Clinton? Or if you don't want to do that, maybe Kitty can tell us uh, <laughs> what, what her observations are. I'm looking for specifics. Hers will be so one-sided as to be uh, unacceptable in this forum. Yeah, I mean, I think we have two very strong candidates. And like all candidates, they have their strengths and their weaknesses. I mean, none of us is perfect, needless to say. Uh, on the one hand, you have an extremely bright and talented woman who has uh, done a lot of things in her life, including spending eight years in the White House. Now, that's not being the president, but it's not insignificant when it comes to dealing with these kinds of issues. And she, as we all know, um, was deeply and actively involved in a lot of what her husband was doing. By the way, as she was when he was governor and as Kitty was when I was governor. And there's nothing unprecedented about that, right? Because a woman named Eleanor Roosevelt did that a long time ago, and by the way, was vilified, especially for advocacy of civil rights at a time when her husband wasn't exactly a great civil rights advocate. I mean, uh, leaders in the black community didn't go to Franklin. They went to Eleanor. In case you've forgotten, we incarcerated 120,000 Japanese Americans under Franklin Roosevelt. Remember? And the Supreme Court of the United States said it was OK. So um, advocacy from the First Lady, at least beginning in the 1930s, is not a new thing. What I don't understand is why Hillary has these very high negatives. And she's had them almost from the time she and her husband went into the White House, especially among white guys. What is it? They don't like strong and assertive women? Lord, I've been surrounded by them for the last 45 years. One is here, and I've got two others. One's in Denver and one's in San Francisco, and I love it. I mean, it's a little annoying at times. <laughs> and anyway, in this day and age, what do we want? But it's, it's a factor out there. She's very smart. She knows her stuff. I'm particularly impressed with, with where she's coming from on economic issues, which are going to be very important. I mean, this is not something that somebody just briefed her on yesterday. I mean, she feels in her gut. And I'm with her. You know, the strength of this country, folks, spiritually as well as economically, has always been in a strong, growing, and prosperous middle class. That's what made the, what's made this country what it is. Trickle-down economics has never worked, and it isn't working now. And she, and she feels it senses it, and expresses it. But there is this high negative, and it's not going to go away. Again, for reasons that I've never understood, and I think it's probably because she's smart, and she's assertive, and she's outspoken, and at least they're speaking of uh, bias against women. I mean, there it is. I mean, there apparently are lots of guys in this country that just don't like women like that. Um, now, again, there are also people who are going to vote for her and work for her, because she is that kind of person, and we'll see what happens. Um, Obama's a very impressive guy. He's not a kid. He's four years older than John Kennedy was when he got elected president of the United States. If he's elected, he will have had 12 consecutive years of experience in elective office, more than Hillary, more than John Edwards, the same as Bill Clinton or George H.W. Bush. Now, eight of those years were spent in the Illinois legislature. For a guy like me, that counts for a lot. 
because I think you're a better public official if you spend time at the state or local level before you go to Washington. And I mean that. And he was an extremely effective state legislator. Asked the Republicans, who had a lot of respect for this guy, and a strong consensus builder. Admittedly, he's never run a government, but then Hillary hasn't either. Nor did Jack Kennedy. Kennedy had never been a chief executive. Not only that, but those of us who run for the presidency from governorships and like to think, hey, we've managed, yeah, but we've never been in Washington. We've never really been engaged and involved directly in uh, either national politics or foreign policy, certainly. So there are pluses and minuses. Um, believe me, if Barack Obama gets this nomination, uh, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing when it comes to the kinds of attacks that are going to be made on him. I would hope that John McCain, in this case, uh, will step up and do everything he can to stop that kind of stuff. And uh, there we are. So where do I come out on this, Dan? They each have strengths and they each have weaknesses. I can't begin to tell you. I know what the polls say. The polls say that, well, matched up against McCain, he does a little better than Hillary. But that's now. I mean, I was never realistically 17 points ahead of George H.W. Bush, but I was 9 or 10 points ahead of him. And that lead, so-called, absolutely got blown away as a result of that attack campaign and my now incomprehensible fated to deal with it. So there's going to be a lot of water under and over the dam between the time we finally have a nominee, whenever that is, and, uh, and when people go to vote. Because I anticipate a very tough attack campaign, no matter which one of these folks is running. That's why I think this precinct-based organization is so important. If immediately after the swift boat attack, an army of precinct workers went right out on the street, well-informed over the internet immediately about the real facts, because it was a pack of lies, and were back on the doorsteps talking to the very same people, all those jakes out there that they already got to know, and here it is, and take a look at this, and if you have any questions, let me know. I think that would have significantly blunted the attack, but. There was no such army, so it had an impact. Yeah. Uh, I have two complaints, and you, you haven't addressed those, but it's something that is reflected in this room. Uh, first of all, this is one of the longest campaigns I've experienced. I am so sick and tired of hearing all of the candidates. It's been two years at least that we have been uh, uh, addressed by what's going on. Secondly is the amount of money. I think it's a disgrace that what these candidates are spending. Why can't we be like our allies like England, France, and Germany? They have short elections, and they do very well with it. That's my complaint. Both well, good questions, and there's one very short answer. I'm sorry I've already given in response to other questions. It's called the First Amendment. You could not constitutionally in this country prevent a candidate from going to Iowa four years in advance in campaigning. I mean, that's just reality. Now, when it comes to the regulation of campaign finance, there, there are some interesting questions which um, concern me. I mean, you know, we have a Supreme Court with what may be a majority that is prepared to rule that you can't regulate campaign finance at all because money is speech. And that majority will be made up of people who call themselves strict constructionists. Now, I've read the United States Constitution, folks, at least a couple of thousand times. I'm still looking for the place in the Constitution that says money is speech. In fact, McCain, who's been a leader in the fight for campaign finance reform, and more credit to him, said not too long ago, if, that's, if money is speech, then 99% of us are disenfranchised. And who are the folks in the court who are leading the charge? Well, my old classmate, Scalia. Class of 1960, Harvard Law School. He says he's a strict constructionist. Help me. Bush versus Gore, strict constructionist. Money is speech, strict constructionist. I'm sorry. I don't buy it. I think we ought to be able to reasonably regulate campaign finance. Now, having said that, having said that, here again, one of the great things about the internet, which John McCain in his first campaign, and Howard Dean, and now Obama, 
are showing us is that you can raise an awful lot of money from a very broad base of relatively modest contributors. And, this is my gloss, and turn them into precinct workers at the same time. Obama's raising a million dollars a day, most of it over the internet. I mean, that's extraordinary. And it's really democratizing the process in a very impressive way. I'd feel even better if Kitty got an email one of these days saying, will you be a precinct captain? <laughs> and not just send money. But um, don't kid yourself, folks. A good candidate can raise all the money he or she needs from a very broad base of relatively modest contributors. I never took PAC money. I never took lobbyist money. I wouldn't let the lobbyists raise money for me. And I raised more money than any of the other Democrats in 1988. We had 400,000 contributors. That was unprecedented at the time. And we didn't have any internet. It's all direct mail and telephones, all that kind of stuff. But um, a candidate who has some appeal and can reach out to people can do that. But that is not an answer to excessive amounts of money that are being spent. And, and I think uh, Congress has the right constitutionally to reasonably regulate campaign finance. And I hope that um, we don't get a ruling from the Supreme Court, which essentially totally deregulates campaign finance. Now, needless to say, you get somebody in the White House who wants to pick people that are the kinds of folks I want to see in the Supreme Court of the United States. And, and I think the, the danger of that kind of a ruling uh, will disappear. But you know, uh, John McCain is already saying he's going to appoint nothing but strict constructionists. Of course, I don't know how they're going to come out on, <laughs> on money as speech, but there we are. Yeah. Well, I think it's very interesting now that finally the subject of the Supreme Court has come up, because that was my that was what I was going to talk about. And when you talked about character assassination, it made me recall the destruction of Anita Hill when she tried to warn the country that this was a shallow man that we were trying to put on the Supreme Court. It was so effective that I, listening at home, was convinced that she was lying. And I phoned my daughter, who's a young attorney in Berkeley, and I said, Lori, I think she's lying. And she said to me, Mother, are you mad? She is a well-respected attorney, and, and she had connections. My daughter had connections with her in the legal community. Yeah. She, she now teaches at Brandeis, by the way. She is. Well, huh? Wellesley, now? Brandeis. Wellesley, Brandeis. Well, they're but a stone's throw from each other. She could actually teach at both. Uh, anyway, yeah. But my question is really the whole process of appointing people to the Supreme Court. I have never heard that uh, brought up as a possible consideration for change in, in the process. In the process of appointing is, people. Yes, because it seems to me to be so politically uh, manipulated. And to the point also that the candidates that are brought up before the, uh, the committee are not vetted properly. Mm -hmm. uh, John, uh, uh, John Dean came here and spoke to us, and he used the word vetted to say that we're not doing that with uh, appointees to the cabinet. We're not doing enough of that vetting. And certainly, a person's views should be exposed for what they are, and I don't think the American people are getting a fair shake, and particularly where it comes to the Supreme Court. Good question, good comments. Um, I don't have an easy answer. Now, when I was governor, and in Massachusetts, the governor picks the judges, just the way the president picks the judges. Um, and we don't have Senate confirmation. We have something called the Executive Council, which has very limited powers, but one of those powers is confirming judicial appointments. Um, I created something called the Judicial Nominating Committee, commission. We had never had one before. Now, I've been a lawyer. I had appeared in front of good judges, and frankly, I had appeared in front of lousy judges, and most of those lousy judges had been appointed for political reasons. So I was determined to try to see if I could depoliticize the process. And I created this commission of 18 people, nine lawyers, nine non-lawyers. Uh, one of them had to be the dean of a law school, one of them had to be the a designee of uh, the bar association, this kind of stuff. And basically, under an executive order, I said to them, you are going to be completely responsible 
for screening and recommending judgeships to me. I want three candidates for every vacant judgeship. And I will bind myself to pick one of the three. Now, there are a lot of skeptics. We have a talk show host who was no fan of mine, and was our kind of local limbo, and yeah, it's going to be all political and so on and so forth. I think if you ask people, they'll tell you we get some of the best judges we have. And of course, these were at every level, trial judges, appellate judges, Supreme Court judges, and so on. Could you do that nationally? I think it would be tough. Uh, it would be interesting if we had a president who was prepared to do that. On the other hand, the first thing that would happen would be uh, intense scrutiny of the members of the commission to see where they're coming from. And let's face it, folks, uh, there are profound ideological issues bound up in what the Supreme Court does. Sorry, but these are issues that, uh, you know, abortion is not uh, a run-of-the-mill issue. Uh, warrantless wiretapping is not a run-of-the-mill issue, particularly when you're faced with serious national security threats. I mean, these are tough, difficult issues, and, and people's philosophy and ideology play a role. That's why you have these splits in the court these days. And, you know, the swing vote. First it was Sandra Day O'Connor, now it's Kennedy. Um, Who's it going to be next? So there's no, you cannot depoliticize the court. Can you, can you try to make the appointment process uh, somewhat more thoughtful and rational? Yeah, maybe with the creation of some form of nominating commission. I think you have those in California, don't you? Aren't there nominating commissions that advise the governor on uh, judicial appointments? I think so, but I may be wrong. Uh, it worked for me, I can tell you that. And not only that, but it it encouraged a lot of very good lawyers who, under the old system, would have never dreamed of uh, getting involved in that process, who began to say, hey, this thing maybe is legit, you know? I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe I, should, I should apply. And they did. And I appointed people I didn't know, uh, folks that I don't think uh, would have been candidates without that kind of system. Yeah. I was probably uh, two years old in 1988, so this is all. But you were alive. That's right. <laughs> but Can I tell you a quick story? Sure. I was over at the Kennedy School a couple of years ago, uh, and, and once in the spring, Harvard invites all of the kids that it's accepted to come for a weekend and kind of look at the place and, and see whether or not they like it and encourage and so forth. And when it was all over, I gave folks my little pitch about public service, get involved in politics, and so on and so forth. A young woman came up to me and she said, I have a story to tell you. She said, I was born the day of the 1988 election by Caesarean section. And my mother insisted that the doctors sew her up so she could put on her clothes and go down and vote for you. <laughs> I said, you tell your mother that she is in the Dukakis Hall of Fame for life. Yeah? Anyway, go ahead. Um, I, you know, wasn't alive in 1960 or 1968 when there were, you know, disputed conventions. What would a disputed convention look like in 2008? Were the nominees not decided? We have to do all this questioning because most of the time I've seen conventions, it's basically a four-day commercial, more or less. What would a disputed convention look like today? It, it will all depend on what happens in Texas, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and a bunch of other states, by the way, including North Carolina, which has got a pretty substantial delegation as well. People don't talk about North Carolina. Um, if we arrive at the convention and uh, one of these two candidates does not have, I don't want to call it a decisive majority, but something that's pretty significant, I think it's going to be an interesting convention. But hey, in 1960, I was in Los Angeles with one of my buddies who just got out of law school, took the bar exam, drove out to the West to see our hero, Jack Kennedy. He didn't clinch that thing until they got to Wyoming. Now, that was the old convention where, you know, a lot of bosses decided who the delegates were and that kind of thing. Uh, it didn't seem to detract from, uh, from his effort in the final. So uh, I'm not that concerned about the fact that we're going to have some controversy. The interesting question is going to be, what do the superdelegates do? I mean, how do they go about the process of trying to exercise their best judgment, which is, after all, why they're superdelegates in the first place? 
And I think a lot of that will depend on what happens between now and the end of the primaries. If there's a perception that one of these candidates has run a much better campaign than the other, that's going to count for some. Uh, but I'm not sure. We'll have to wait, folks. Uh, we'll have to wait and see, because, you know, Hillary may surprise a lot of people. And she's a fighter. And there's something about this. I, I can't explain it. Remember when Bill Clinton had kind of clinched the nomination, but Jerry Brown beat him about six, about six times? It was this kind of, what was it, four times or five times? I can't remember. In any event, there's this kind of, Democrats in particular aren't wild about front runners. They're always trying to kind of cut them down to size a little bit. You know, I mean, for a long time, Obama's been, you know, the guy that's right now. Maybe he's up there. Maybe she's the one that's the underdog. We'll see. We'll see what happens here. Um, but nobody can predict anything other than you hope that, A, the superdelegates exercise their best judgment, and B, whoever wins, or let me put it this way, whoever loses accepts the result. If we come out of there with blood on the floor, it's not going to be fun, and it's not going to do us a lot of good in the final. So I think... Uh, I think it's very important that, that people understand that uh, somebody wins and somebody loses in this business. But nobody can tell you what's going to happen. What's it going to be like? Who knows? You know? So there's no, just wait and see. There's no like historical, yeah, yeah, just wait and see. Well, I, I was in the hall when uh, the votes were being, you know, the delegations were being announced uh, when Jack Kennedy was, uh, and I was there that night when he came over to thank the delegates. Um, and it was, it was nip and tuck. And then uh, the congressman from Wyoming, Tito Roncalo, I think that was his name. Was it Tito or Tino? I can't remember. He was a Democratic congressman from Wyoming. He's the guy that announced the vote in Wyoming, which put Kennedy over the top. It's exciting. Last question. Here he is. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, for being here today. Before I ask the ask the last question on behalf of the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute at UCSD. Thank you very much. My question is, it's a one question with three parts. <laughs> Part A is, who do you think Romney, uh, not Romney, McCain would pick as a vice president? Part B is, if uh, Obama wins, who do you think? And if Hillary wins, do you think she'll pick Obama? Well, let me start with the third. I don't think Obama, if he loses, will want to be a vice presidential nominee. For a lot of reasons. I mean, it's just my sense of things. Um, I have no idea who Obama would pick. And I really don't have any idea who McCain will pick. I will tell you, and I'll try to keep this as brief as I can. I made a lot of mistakes in 88. Um, the one thing I did well was to pick my running mate. And I'll tell you how I did it. Um, you know, we had had experiences with the picking of running mates that turned out to be somewhat disastrous. So I asked my campaign chairman, your cousin, Paul Bronis, to head up the vice presidential selection process. And uh, we invited uh, suggestions from anybody and everybody. We took the list and we gradually, for a variety of reasons, narrowed it down to four. John Glenn, Al Gore, Dick Gebhardt, and Lloyd Benson. Then we organized four task forces of volunteer lawyers and accountants assigned to each of those candidates who did an absolutely exhaustive analysis of their finances, their personal life, and they had to be willing to subject themselves and their families to this. Now, all four of them were excellent. And any one of them would have been a good running mate. Without getting into the whys and wherefores, if you have picked people, and as governor, I picked dozens of folks, and, and it's one of the things I loved about being a chief executive, you know, putting your team together, picking people, trying to pull together the very best people you could and stuff. If you do it right, it almost automatically leads to the right choice. It's hard to describe, but it does. By the time the process was over, it was unmistakably clear to my pal Bronis and me and a lot of other people that Benson was the guy. And I thought he was a damn good choice and if I had run a better national campaign and quite frankly involve Lloyd more actively in the strategic side of things because you know he had beaten Bush decisively for the Senate but we spent too much time out on the road not enough time talking to each other. I really mean that. Um, had it been closer 
it's clear that Benson could have made the difference. Could have made it, maybe two or three points, but could have made the difference. So my advice to the candidates, because I can't tell you who the choice ought to be, is follow that process. And I'm one of the interesting things about uh, Bill Clinton in 92 was that he asked Warren Christopher to do what I had asked Paul Brunus to do, that is to head up that search. Christopher asked Brunus for the memo he gave me in June of 88, laying out this process, and they followed it to a T. And who did they come up with? A very improbable choice. Al Gore, I mean, on form, why would you pick a guy from Tennessee to run with a guy from Arkansas? But it was a terrific choice. And they came out of that convention. Remember, Clinton was third in the polls in June. Who was first? Ross Perot. <laughs> Clinton was not in great shape at all going into that convention. He came out of the convention, I think in part because of his selection of Gore. They got on that bus and they started hitting communities all across the country, and they won. So, um, well, I can't tell you who it ought to be, and I don't have any idea. I mean, there are a lot of people out there that might be good. Uh, the single most important, and I'll stop with this, the single most important quality that a presidential nominee must look for in a vice presidential running mate is can that person be a first-rate president if, God forbid, something happens to the president? Everything else pales by comparison. Geography, this, that, and the other thing. And that was the criterion, I think, that Bill Clinton used in picking Al Gore. I don't think it was the criterion that George Bush used in picking Dan Quayle. <laughs> and uh, let me simply conclude, Stan, by saying this. Um, you know, poor old Quayle, where is he now that we need him? Need him uh, it's interesting. He was the guy that went to Venezuela and apologized to the Venezuelans because he couldn't speak to them in Latin, their native language. <laughs> That's a true story. Um, I'm not sure this story is true, but you remember when the, when the uh, earthquake hit the, North, uh, the, uh, the earthquake in San Francisco? Remember in the middle of the World Series? Remember that? And, uh, and uh, Bush called Quayle into his office. He did, you know. He said, Dan, I want you to go out to the epicenter of that thing and do everything you can to help those people. And four days later, they found Quayle wandering around Orlando, Florida. Anyway, my dear wife is giving me the hook. Nice to see you.